Our next uh, and final conversation for the day is, will health tech ever be hack-proof? Uh, we're going to focus on the security, privacy, and vulnerability of mobile health technologies. And uh, leading the conversation is our co my colleague, Peter Singer, a strategist and senior fellow at New America, founder of Neo Luddite, a technology advisory firm, and the author of multiple award-winning books, and a contribu contributing editor at Popular Science. So take it away. Great. Thank you. So the title of this, as was said, was uh, Will Health Tech Ever Be Hack-Proof? And um, I'm going to go ahead and say no, uh, because frankly, the human body has never been hack-proof. Um, and it's got a, a lot longer lead in terms of compared to medical tech. But the point they were really wrestling with here is that um, we're seeing an explosion in the possibilities of technology being applied to the field of medicine and their cross, particularly with IT, but also an accompanying explosion in terms of the potential risks, as we just heard in the presentation beforehand. And that's largely driven by the fact that much of this technology, like the rest of the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything, whatever you want to call it, the bits and pieces, the physical parts, weren't designed with security in mind, including those that are medically related. And the very real risk of this um, first came to attention, at least to me, at the 2011 Black Hat uh, Cybersecurity Conference. And at 2011 Black Hat, a diabetic man named Jerome Radcliffe showed how someone could do this kind of wireless, um, uh, this hacking into wireless insulin pumps. And since then, we've seen this play out in lots of different ways, as we heard in the past presentation, both in terms of the devices, but also people going after the various players in the healthcare systems from the front line in terms of the hospitals, all the way back to the drug companies, where we've seen hacking of them to try and figure out how their drug trials are going so that you can game the stock market around it. And so what we're going to do is uh, explore some of the important questions that, that surround the privacy regulations, the security issues in this space. And I think what's uh, fantastically interesting about them is that it's a space that connects almost every level of concern. That is, you can think about this topic as a personal concern. There's nothing more important to you at the personal level than your health. You can think about it in terms of a business concern, an organization, whether you're a healthcare company, a hospital, uh, the, the VA. And you can also think about it in terms of a national security, global security level concern. And so we've put together just an absolutely fantastic panel to help us uh, work through this. You, uh, we already heard from Kevin Fu, so I'm not going to give the, the further introduction. I think he basically illustrated that he's the man when it comes to these kind of discussions. Um, but fortunately, we've got two other really great people to join him. Uh, we've got Alvaro Bedoya, who's an intersection in terms of the uh, looking at privacy law and technology. Technology. He's the executive director of the Center on Privacy Technology at Georgetown, and he also comes to this with an experience on Capitol Hill uh, where he was um, chief counsel to Senator Al Franken and worked on the Senate subcommittee on privacy. And then we also have uh, Lucia Savage, who works at the intersection of health, IT, law, privacy, and public policy. And she's uh, chief privacy officer at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. And so, um, Rather than uh, asking them each to make further presentations, we're just kick off in the conversation. And so I, I want to um, open it up by asking each of you, what do you see as the key implications on the security side of the introduction of all of this new health technology, particularly when it comes to mobile? Which is, you know, the first panel was looking at the tech itself. What do you think are the key implications on the security aspects of it? Why don't we just go down in the road again? So, Kevin, you've already played a little bit. Oh, okay. So, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll begin. So, when, when I think of uh, what's coming down the line, it's it's I, the, the word that comes to mind is complexity. Uh, and uh, the more the devices are interoperating, um, the more complex these interfaces become. The more complex the failures become. Um, and and complexity uh, is is basically what a a hacker wants uh, because complexity tends to breed um, the ability to, to cause problems. So. Um, my, my concern is about how to tame that complexity so that we can reduce uh, all the security and privacy issues. Um, I, I think that's sort of the best approach in general. Um, uh, start by reducing the complexity in the first place. You don't have the problems to begin with. So I, you know, I think 
Kevin has done a great job speaking to the security side. I, I do want to speak to the privacy side of it because it's very connected. And I think the key risk that we have is that we will create a pool of extremely sensitive health data that is totally unregulated and that is shared broadly uh, uh, without our knowledge and used in ways we do not know. So we uh, tend to talk about mHealth uh, apps and devices as if they're one thing. When it comes to privacy, there's two kinds of mHealth apps and devices. There's a kind that's protected uh, by privacy law, and there's a kind that's not. And the kind that's protected is used by a doctor in a medical setting, uh, um, it, it, which covers it under HIPAA and High Tech Act, the federal health privacy laws. And the kind that is not, uh, 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 that is not protected is everything else. So, uh, um, and we tend to think that's okay because the kind of health data you have in a hospital and a medical setting is really sensitive and like your Fitbit's not that sensitive, right? And that's not true. With this latest generation of devices, you have devices that track not just how far you run, the number of calories you burn, they also track um, what your blood glucose level is, your heart rate, uh, your fertility. There are actually wearable fertility monitors right now that will not only track sexual activity, but actually whether or not uh, uh, you are at the peak fertile time of the month. Um, and uh, uh, unless it is deployed in that medical setting, it's not protected. And what you're seeing is that it's being shared very broadly uh, and it's being shared with data brokers and other parties and it needs to be fixed. It's interesting to compare though in the discourse in cybersecurity overall in politics today, we have created this sense of a tension mm -hmm. between privacy and security. You can see this in the, in the encryption debate that's okay. going on where we're saying almost right. you have to choose one or the other. Um, can you, you, know, you seem to be taking a very different position when you apply it down to healthcare. Yeah, you know, I, I, see, a, I see a potential tension um, between uh, um, privacy and national security on the encryption debate, but here I think it is an unalloyed good to have consumers know more about the data that's being collected about them and to have some control about where it's being shared. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I, I, and you see this also, this isn't just a consumer privacy advocate talking, this is, this is the most, uh, 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 the largest, most uh, 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 wealthy company in the world, Apple, has said if you run your uh, health and fitness app through our operating system, you cannot share this data with third parties without your customer's consent. And so um, there's consensus in industry, but the law doesn't recognize it. And so the big question, and in order to fix this, uh, uh, you need to have enforcement by companies, and you need, ha need to have a few key actions by folks like the FDA, for example. Mm -hmm. but th there's a whole other piece to that, just building on what Alfredo was saying, which is we also have an environment where people increasingly want to m make use of their data that's in somebody else's custody, and they can't. And sometimes they can't because of security or privacy used as an excuse. So we have personal story. You know, I'm the chief privacy officer at ONC, and I went to an urgent care center, and I asked them to email the visit result to my regular doctor, and they said, privacy law doesn't let me do that. And I went, oh, my God, I have so much work to do. But that's, that's a really simple version of that. But to this point of if you have that fertility collector and you want to now send it to your OBGYN or whoever your fertility specialist is, and the company that runs that device won't let you because they own the data or they claim custody over it, that impedes the whole part of the patient engagement. So it's really both, both and. We have this situation right. where, on the one hand, we need consumers to know and understand better, particularly because there's only so far that the sort of paternalistic protections a big company can supply will take you. And on the other hand, if we really want consumers to take action on their own data, and not ownership like property, but like ownership like I own my health and I'm going to take care of my health, we have to give them the ability to make that data move despite somebody's custody. So how do you go after that? I mean, you're saying we need consumers to better well, understand. I mean, so. it, it's incremental. I was just saying to somebody yesterday, I feel like one of those ants in the kids' movies, you know, where you're carrying the seed and then the rain falls on you and you have to run under the leaf and you come back out. But, you know, <laughs> we, we, it's really incremental. So at, at ONC, the step we've now taken is we propose that for view, download, transmit. So those of you who are not on your physician's portals, you should be because we paid a lot of money for those portals. Um, but you can take that portal when this new rule gets uh, takes effect and use it to send data directly to an API of a third party you choose, right? So there has to be that technical capability. So we have to put more power into the consumer hands, but at the same time, the consumers need to take responsibility for the power they have. You know, we hopefully are not publishing our pins for our online banking, you know, in red lights on our front doors, 
we shouldn't do that with the way we keep our own health information secure. Do you two want to weigh in on the consumer side? Yeah, you know, I, I think there are very um, simple things that could be done to change the status quo. And, and, and l let me add one other thing to the, to the scare pile that I think Kevin, <laughs> Kevin started building. Um, FTC last year looked at 12 apps, right? And uh, they looked at, uh, they weren't just, you know, running apps, they were also pregnancy tracking apps and, and, and heart health apps. And of those 12 apps, they shared all that sensitive data with 76 different third parties. This is May of last year, this is a year ago, right? Um, so what do you do to fix it? First of all, um, companies need to make more promises and they need to live up to them. So Apple has this great rule, right? Don't share with third parties without uh, your customer's consent. Apple had that same rule for geolocation uh, and has had it, I think, since the existence of iOS, uh, 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 basically iOS. And in 2011, uh, my old boss, Senator Franken, asked Bud Tribble, how many apps have you kicked out of the Apple App Store for violating that rule? And the answer was zero. And so uh, um, Apple needs to enforce its promises, and Google should, should uh, uh, make the same promise. Uh, it, should, it should empower users of the Android operating system that control. And FDA, there's one very specific thing FDA can do. FDA is something, has done something that on the whole is probably very positive. Um, in order to let folks innovate without having to go through what is a very onerous uh, 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 process for medical devices, it said, look, there are medical devices that are definitely medical devices. Uh, uh, so, you know, if there is a smartphone app that literally shows you an EKG on the smartphone uh, while you're treating a patient, medical device, right? There are things that are definitely not medical devices, like, uh, you know, accounting software in a doctor's office, right? And then there's everything else. And for everything else, we are going, not going to force them through the medical device application certification process because they pose a lower risk to the public. FDA could do something very simple. They could simply say, if you are sharing your users' sensitive data to third parties, you do not pose a low risk to the public, and you will not benefit from this extra coverage. And uh, that'll be well in line with what Apple's doing, and I think it'd make a big difference. Kevin, I want to ask this question, but in a slightly different way of view, which is the consumers that in the, in the prior presentation you talked about dealing with were essentially medical professionals as opposed to the consumer field overall. So how do, you, how do we go after the awareness side among medical professionals? Right. So um, medical professionals are not too different from uh, every other person in the country when it comes to cybersecurity hygiene. Um, so they're taught to wash their hands before, uh, in, in between patient encounters, but they're not uh, taught as well as for this sort of cybersecurity hygiene. Um, I'd say we have a, a very long way to go. Um, I, I hesitate to say to put all my bets on education be, because education alone is, is not going to be enough to teach them about, about the importance, but um, it, it, the, it's, the bar is very low right now. So let me give you a story to illustrate that. I have a colleague who's in uh, electrophysiology. These are the people who implant pacemakers. Uh, and the senior uh, physician uh, in his group uh, is widely known to be uh, sort of um, popular with the malware, shall we say. Uh, and, and the senior physician doesn't exactly know what to do to, to clean this magic malware uh, off his USB drive. So he just plugs it into the junior fellow's computer in the morning and it magically somehow sanitizes it. Um, so there, there's a I think a lack of understanding about um, uh, how does uh, malware spread and what are effective ways to uh, keep, it, keep it out of systems. Um, and it's out of sight, out of mind, just like microbes were in the 1840s. Um, and so it, it took 165 years to get to the point where we understand that you wash your hands to get rid of those microbes, but we're, we're nowhere near that when it comes to So is to the idea that the, the training and awareness is something that needs to be done within the professional community, a lot like how, for example, uh, the the ABA, the lawyer profession, you know, you work in a courtroom, but we're now starting to see cybersecurity training for lawyers that we need sort of the same for medical professionals is just part of your job, part of your business. Um, yeah, yes, edu and education will be one point. Uh, for instance, maybe you shouldn't be just downloading uh, random things on the internet on the same machine you're using to manipulate patient data. Um, so I, I, I see this, uh, so I take my students into the operating room um, and, and they watch live surgery and we see what, you know, the Gmail being checked. 
uh, and we, we know that um, uh, an imperfect human can, uh, and we all are, can easily get infected uh, through these mechanisms. So there's, um, education will play one part, but also some of the organizational structures are encouraging this. Uh, just like in any big organization, you have policies fighting policies, uh, and you'll see that in large hospitals as well. Okay. Can I just add a reality check to that? So six years ago, only 20% of American physicians used an electronic health record in their office, and now it's up to about 80. So in many ways, those really small businesses that are outside of large institutional settings, like University of Michigan Medical Center, for example, um, you know, they're learning now what those of us who work in industries that computerized earlier had to learn in 1992 about how you store your passwords or what is password complexity. And all the time we hear about situations where, you know, there's a physician and there's the spouse who's running the back end of the office and there's a part-time nurse and the passwords are literally on a post-it note on some cabinet door, um, which is no more secure than leaving your front door open. And I had somebody ask me recently, well, will the government help us pay for security? And I said, we don't subsidize putting locks on the door of your clinic. Why would we subsidize all of that too? You know, there's a limit to taxpayer largesse. But we just have to recognize that across the healthcare spectrum, really wide um, economic capabilities as well as capitalization to address this problem. And so education is important, but sometimes people are really just in the nascent, nascent stages of, of learning how to turn on their EHR, mm -hmm. let alone mm -hmm. complex passwords or not to use thumb drives. Could I, could I add one more point? Um, there, there's also a lack, there, there is no sort of silver bullet or magic pixie dust you can just purchase. Imagine you have infinite money. Even if you have infinite money, you wouldn't be able to go out and buy something that solves your security problem today. Um, and, and I would liken that to the 1840s with hand washing. Running water was kind of scarce in hospitals. Latex gloves hadn't yet been invented. So it was a kind of a big ask to even ask for hand washing back then. And right now it's still a big ask to say, just make it secure mm -hmm. uh, because the solutions aren't innovated yet. Well, this, this raises an interesting point because um, as you put it, uh, you can't rely on the government to do everything in the field of cybersecurity in general. And what we're seeing though um, and is both a call for the government to do everything, which is not gonna happen, but then you have the second part of it, which is you have the slow but very significant creation of a cybersecurity insurance industry. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, is that something that you think will move over into the healthcare sector and play a key role in this when it comes to both, when I say healthcare, I mean, and basically going back to the prior panel, it, we're, we're referring to bo both health, traditional healthcare companies, but now technology mm -hmm. companies that are playing the role in this space. What do you see in terms of the kind of the market incentives? You talked about consumers, we've talked about government, but there's other market incentives that are in play. Where do you see these in this space? So I think um, if we break it down by size, I think in really large um, activities, for example, the really large statewide data projects that may or may not be sponsored by states, those are key candidates or key customers for the emerging area of more cyber insurance in healthcare because the data is so voluminous. A project in California carries you know, data on 10 million people for three years. That's, I can't even count how many zeros are on the bytes there, but you can all imagine that it's a lot versus an individual physician practice. And I think that um, size is going to drive two parts of that. One is there's going to be a point in the future, and I don't know when it's going to be, maybe when you know I have grandkids, that not using um, the best technology to care for your patient is going to be the thing that people won't insure. Right now, there's no like uh, you know sort of malpractice insurance for using computers or not using computers. That hasn't evolved yet. But as that evolves, cyber insurance will go along with it at the small practice level. But the big institutions are already trying to figure out how to do that, especially if they're in multi-party arrangements like ACOs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's talk Congress. Where are they in this? What can and should they do? SDR. Sure. Yeah. You know, um, so there is a sad fact in the field of commercial privacy, um, which is nothing's happening and nothing's going to happen. Um, on government privacy, when it comes to NSA, it's a little bit better uh, because you can form alliances across the aisle to uh, um, work with Republicans and Democrats um, and come close to passing a um, 
uh, a privacy bill. So hence you have ACPA, you know, being close to getting passed, and this is the law that lets police look through your email if it's like 181 days old without a warrant. Um, uh, the NSA bill came two votes, uh, 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 two votes shy of getting a full debate. But um, if you look at commercial privacy, um, not a single commercial privacy bill was even voted out of committee in the last Congress and the Senate, and I'm pretty sure in the House as well. Um, if you look at privacy more broadly, and you'll see where I'm going with this, um, take a wild guess uh, uh, as, to, as to the number of privacy bills of any kind that were passed last Congress. Zero, right? Uh, and that's not my favorite number. But um, so, uh, and you can, a different question is how many privacy bills were, were passed in California in that same period? And the number 17. And so I think uh, uh, where this can actually start to get fixed is in the states. Uh, and uh, you've seen Texas, I believe, pass a law that bans the use of health data in certain ways, regardless of the setting in which it uh, comes from. And you've seen various states uh, innovate, basically be little laboratories of privacy and democracy by passing their own laws with regard to biometrics and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think we need to look to the states uh, for action here, and we need to look to FTC and FDA. Uh, the challenge with that, however, though, is as we try to build uh, standards for how the healthcare system will operate with technology, if we have rules that vary from state to state, the, it's just monumentally harder to build a nationwide system because then Texas is doing something different from California and there's Arizona and New Mexico in between. So it's, we have to think about that, but I, I agree. I mean, there's, there's no current activity to open these debates, even though many things are different now than were uh, existed in 1997 when HIPAA was passed, or even in the 70s when we had a big round of privacy um, legislation, both the Privacy Act federally and at the state level. You know, we've, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, we've kind of undone cherry picking through underwriting. So if we're locking up health data to um, prevent people from getting insurance, have we solved that problem in a different way? We, we're not asking ourselves those questions. And if we were to ask those questions, we would be able to tackle the security that goes with the way we want to use the data. Mm -hmm. If I can add just one thing. So just to, just to clarify, um, I'm actually not advocating at all any that, that states pass their own little no, mini No, but you're observing. You're observing that they're doing it. Uh, uh, so so um, perhaps, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think, I think states are preempted from doing their own, you know, they can actually go above and beyond, I think, security settings under high tech, right, uh, um, un, uh, under certain health security laws. But I'm not saying states should, should modify the uh, health and uh, the privacy and security standards that apply in the medical setting. I think states should innovate and pass their own privacy and security laws with respect to health information that is not covered under okay. HIPAA and high tech. And there what you would see is a race to the top. And uh, what you would see companies getting founded anywhere in the United States saying, okay, what rule do I have to follow? Do I want customers in New York? I do. And so I need to follow the standard. And as long as the laws aren't crazy, and, you know, some of them, some are, you know, crazy laws come out sometimes. But as long as they're not crazy, um, they, uh, uh, it'll create a race to the top and it'll be better for, for consumers everywhere, I think. But this has been a very U.S.-centric discussion for technologies that will go global. Uh, where do you see other states, i.e. nation states in this, and are there models that we might learn from? Hmm. So my prior position um, at United Healthcare, I had a colleague whose job it was to manage the privacy um, in this setting where uh, United has an international division, they offer clinics, on-site clinics in remote parts of the world for American companies who have workforces there, like the extraction industry, and they actually have the capability to helicopter for people to offshore international water-based boats that have full-blown hospitals on them, right? And his job was to manage which privacy rule applied in which part of the transaction between that on-site clinic at the extraction location, the boat, and then maybe, you know, either a European location or an American location, depending on the illness of the, you know, because these workers can get really severely injured through um, industrial accidents. I think that was the most fascinating job ever. And that's where, I, you know, we, we do have medical tourism. It will grow, particularly for the people who have insurance, because, you know, you can get LASIK in South Korea for $800, and here it's still in the $2,000 range. So get a vacation, get your eyes done. So that's, I'm thinking 10 years down the road, it'll be about medical tourism, perhaps international telemedicine. We'll have to sort that out. Mm -hmm. 
Let me make one comment about the international, less about the regulatory, but just sort of on the security side. Um, some stories I've been picking up from my colleagues uh, in, in other countries, countries where they, where they uh, are less fortunate, they have less robust healthcare uh, industries. Well, guess where all the um, uh, depreciated equipment in hospitals go? They exactly. sell them to other countries. So all the problems we're having right now, guess who's going to have those problems in mm. 10 years? So uh, these devices uh, are not going to be destroyed. They're, they're likely going to be uh, reused. And so there's going to be a huge amount of legacy out there. Mm. Um, that actually connects to a project here we have on, on the cybersecurity side, looking at it as whether cybersecurity itself is becoming a rich, poor issue. And you can see that in terms of individual victims versus who's better protected. To your point about companies, larger companies tend to be better at it. But you also see on a global level where we're seeing clustering of cyber crime uh, on sort of a developing world aspect. So it's an interesting parallel to it. Um, I want to go back to the uh, fear factor tour that you took us on and, and uh, let you both join the conversation. What do you see as what's the what's the thing that scares you the most in this space? But then as a follow-up question to that, what do you think will be most common? These are sometimes different. And um, why don't we, we we'll go in reverse order here. Sure. So I, I look at some of the more recent uh, spectacularly sized breaches in healthcare, and I start thinking about things like, well, why were those social security numbers in that Anthem database? That's kind of a well-known fact. And why couldn't they have segregated them out? And there's a pretty significant dialogue about a breach of that size, which is what was it the hackers were going after? Was it data that would let, let them hack into people's financial records and steal financial identities? Or was it data that would let them defraud the healthcare system? Those have two really different economic impacts. And I'm, I don't have an opinion about that. I'm sort of waiting to see how it sorts itself out. Well, and there's a third possibility that was uh, floated, which it was a foreign government looking for identifying information on U.S. government workers mm -hmm. covered by that, i.e., if I want to figure out James Bond's actual right. identity, exactly. his healthcare information is useful to me. And that's why it was uh, alleged to be linked to Chinese state-linked hackers. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's been in the press, but I don't know that there's definitive uh, findings on that. And then you have to look at all the other, you know, Primera might have some U.S. government employees. There's certainly a lot of, you know, military people up in the Northwest, but it's not going to have legislators. So you've got to sort of think all that through. But in my mind, what I'm thinking about is we have to sort of have an, an order of risk so we know where to, we can't address it all at once, particularly not on the um, policy making or rulemaking side. So we have to have an order of magnitude. What is the thing that collectively we're worried about? If, if it's defrauding the healthcare system, we could actually probably figure that out at the point of fraud. If it's stealing people's financial identities, then we need to keep the taxpayer information separate from the health, in health insurance information so that those things are harder to connect. What do you mean by um, w what might be most common? Well, there's a difference between the, um, uh, to use the past example, um, run-of-the-mill breaches, mm -hmm. uh, financial fraud to a spectacular uh, case that's a hit or, um, you know, I could, from not to speak for you, but there's the uh, scariest one might be, oh, I don't know, there was a TV show about a, a presidential, uh, was it the president, the vice president? Yeah, Homeland. Yeah, 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 the vice president in Homeland. But that's not going to be the thing that happens right, to right, everyone. Right. It's probably credit card theft. Yep. So what, it, what do you got see it, in these, you know, there's. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think, uh, um, frankly, I'm quite scared as to what exists today. And um, right now, all this data that's coming out of the unregulated market, right? That's coming out of all the entities that, that Lucia does not have to worry about on a daily basis. Um, Don't worry about them anyway. Right. Uh, um, th uh, uh, all that's being bought up by advertisers, and hey, maybe that's not that bad. Uh, uh, some people are going to hate it, some people, but it's also being bought by data brokers. And these are people who literally create lists of people with STDs, with Parkinson's, with Alzheimer, who are, Alzheimer's disease, who are obese, you know. Um, who uh, are pregnant, you know, and um, we uh, um, we don't know what these folks do with this data, and they exploit various loopholes in laws that regulate insurance. So, um, if I know that someone uh, has one of these conditions, and I 
deny him or her credit because I think he or she is a credit risk. It's one thing. But what if I have a list of a, uh, if I have a neighborhood where I know diabetes is very high? And uh, then I make a credit decision about that or an insurance decision perhaps, um, uh, a not health insurance decision but a life insurance or something like that. That may, may not be covered under existing federal laws. And so I'm worried about um, the, uh, um, I'm worried about the growth of this unregulated market of health data and what it might mean for our finances and our health um, uh, on a regular basis and having decisions made, made about us on a regular basis. And I think the doomsday scenario would be um, just the kind of perfection of that market uh, and the trading of, of, of this health data even more profusely. And, and right now it's kind of behind the scenes a little bit. You know, in order to access it, you need to have... Um, you need to know about the companies. You need to um, present yourself as a, a, a company of a certain size, even though hackers, you know, uh, fraudsters have gone and purchased a bunch of data from a data broker before. But right now, it's not, um, it's not as lively of a market as, as it might be. And so I'm worried about that really uh, uh, becoming, you know, a, a bazaar of, of maladies. All right. Well, m my biggest concern uh, is... Uh, what happens if patients begin to not accept uh, medical care because of fears of, say, right. cybersecurity problems as opposed to uh, actual more sort of scientific studies? It's, it's very easy uh, to base your decision on the most sensational case, one of them being you know, pacemaker problems or, or uh, insulin pump problems. And, and it's not to say those problems aren't real. But uh, what I'm saying is, for instance, I would not be surprised if you're more likely to die from a hangnail uh, you know, than from a, a problem with uh, the security of your pacemaker. But um, uh, I, I, I think it'll be a real tragedy uh, if we are not able to give patients the confidence to um, uh, ex uh, accept the recommendations of their physicians and their, their healthcare team. Uh, these patients who are prescribed medical devices are prescribed because they are predisposed to very unique risks. Uh, uh, and um, so if I'm not prescribed a device, yeah, I definitely wouldn't take one. Uh, because I don't want to be uh, have the chance of the infection, but if I am prescribed a device, I'm much better off with it than without. Um, and uh, if we if we if two things happen, if either we focus too much on the sensational, or if not a, not enough action is happening behind the scenes in manufacturing, uh, eventually the the confidence will be eroded from the patient community. If, uh, Kevin raises an interesting point. So I don't know if anyone in the audience has ever has traveled to Central America in the last couple of years, but you know you cannot use an ATM anywhere in Central America. They're all compromised. <laughs> and I think about this when I think about the Affordable Care Act because we have so many people who now have high deductible health plans. And how are they paying those deductibles? They want to pay them with a credit card in their small physician's practice office. If that swipe machine is not secure, then do they start losing confidence and not just foregoing a device, but foregoing care or you know, fi finding the process of accessing care so inconvenient because they can't use the financial system because it's not secure when they pay for the medical mm -hmm. care. Well, there's a different parallel too, which is the, the vaccine debate. Where well, this you're is very much like is, vaccine, is you're, yeah. you're saying essentially someone ignoring medical advice from their doctor uh, because of something they've heard or read online. Um, and you could have the sort of health, uh, health IT version of this. Well, let's open it up to, to conversation here. More, uh, please um, raise your hand if you have a question and a mic will come to you. Right there. Um, hi, I'm Norman. Um, I work with Tech Change, And you know, I want to try and sort of connect the two conversations we were having about the rise of sort of you know, wearables and you know, sort of remote sensors and being used in healthcare data. And as we've been talking about the security aspect, we haven't really talked about that. And so I, one question I have is, especially as this is becoming more and more um, popular, and as it's both in the consumer and perhaps even um, getting with official healthcare is something that's starting to be used more, and more of that data is being generated, it will become sort of a larger place for people to start looking at to sort of compromise. And how do we try and help secure these systems which don't always necessarily have the processing power? and the capabilities to do some of the things that we think of as necessary for um, sort of cybersecurity? Um, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So at ONC, we've actually been working with Emma Health developers for a while trying to figure out what can be done in the absence of regulation, right? No regulation is, is in the, on the horizon line anytime soon. And there's actually quite a big difference of opinion. There are definitely uh, sort of a group of developers who really want to follow some kind of best practices and are willing to make a commitment about that. And there are other developers who 
Um, a, they don't want to be bothered, or B, they're, they're startup and they don't want to spend their startup capital on the design um, advice they need to make it secure, or C, they just want to sort of grab their money and run. So there's a group who doesn't really want that regulation, and that's going to continue to exist because that's the nature of entrepreneurialism. But I think sort of where the rubber hits the road, at least from my perspective, is, you know, if you're a, con you have, get back to the deal that was in that first panel, the consumer has to really understand the deal. And you should feel free to reject a deal that you don't like. And I'll give you kind of an ironic story, but I have a friend who's pretty sophisticated. She uses Gmail, but not Facebook, because she says Facebook are data thieves. And I'm like, and Gmail's not? Like, I, I kind of doesn't compute. But she's done homework, and she's reached a decision, you know, that works for her. So we have to do a little bit of homework. We have to understand what's the difference between the way, you know, Acme product and beta product, so I don't name names, comport themselves and maybe not buy the beta product. And a great example of that is airbags. Remember when airbags were not required and Chrysler had them and they became such a giant sales tool that everyone adopted them right away, to Alfredo's point. If you pick something that the consumers want, everyone will mirror you. Um, I don't know if I have too much more to add to that. I think it's I think in the consumer space it's it's tough to know what to do because all these companies um, have a financial incentive to be very secure, um, and yet a lot of them aren't. You know, and so um, I, I don't know if I if, if I have the right solution there uh, or, or or good suggestions for how to improve that problem other than. Um, other than I think maybe supporting and investing more in the security research community. Um, I think this is a community that um, has been maligned, uh, that um, federal law uh, um, unfortunately deems a lot of what they do illegal and they survive by, um, by the graces, the good graces of, of the federal prosecutors who don't want to prosecute good faith um, or white hat security researchers. Um, that might be one thing you could do, but yeah, I don't know if there's an overarching. Is there the thing opportunity for the equivalent of a um, bug bounty program within mm -hmm. this space as opposed to software overall? I, I, I think that would be welcome. I, I think that'd be a great idea. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that'd be fantastic. Another thing that would be great is to have a uh, prosecutorial guidance from DOJ that will outlive one administration that says, um, "Hey, you're a security researcher. You're not a bad person." Um, stick within these rules and we're not going to go after you for CFAA. Uh, and uh, I think it'll allow the growth of, um, of white hat security firms uh, that will do a lot of that work and for security researchers to do that work independently. I think that'd be very val valuable and that's something that DOJ has not done, CSIPS has not done so far that, could, that they could do. Okay. Let's get another question. Adrian Gropper, patient privacy rights. Uh, one aspect of security is uh, to have a log, to have something that you can review. And we're all used to having that for our financial accounts. Yet in healthcare, uh, particularly uh, where HIPAA says uh, you have a right to an accounting for disclosures, that is never available. Uh, it's never available conveniently. As somebody said in the earlier panel, you shouldn't need FOIA in order to get to, a, to an interface. Um, what, um, what can you say about uh, the need to have this kind of transparency as to how our data is flowing? And in particular, uh, when you have a lot of data flowing under uh, exclusions like treatment, payment, and operations, or research, and those uses are not disclosed to the patients, how can we develop this culture of A versus B? is using my data one way or the other. Um, so I'm actually going to defer because the agency that does that is the Office for Civil Rights. That's under the HIPAA regulations, as Adrian, I'm sure, knows. And we're waiting for them to issue guidance, at least for the health IT space that's regulated, that tells us exactly what that audit log has to, that accounting for disclosures log has to consist of because the what is being produced industrially right now is, is you know, every click it, it's not mean, it's not doesn't have a meaningful consumer user interface. We'll just put it that way. Um, it, it's voluminous data, um, and in part, the developers, you know, maybe they could apply some UI techniques to that and come up with something on their own. But they're waiting for guidance because they want to do something that is going to be deemed safe for them. I'll just add one thing, um, which is if, if to continue the fear parade. Um, uh, if you want to see something really scary, you should Google. You Google Latanya Sweeney, 2014 FTC. Uh, uh, health workshop, 
And um, she's put together these graphs, which I'm sure you're familiar with, of where your HIPAA and High Tech Act protected data, in other words, the protected pool I've been talking about so generously, where that goes. And it looks like a, um, like a knitting, you know, like a, like, a, like a quilt that's being knitted. Uh, it's just all over the place. And, and I think we presume that when it's in this protected space, um, it's, it's being compartmentalized and treated in a very specific way. But uh, Professor Sweeney has shown that in reality, that data is shared very broadly. Now, at the end of the day, um, uh, if someone slips up or if, someone, if some true wrong occurs in that space, there are remedies um, that are better than in the unregulated space, but still remarkable. Uh, we've got, uh, I've got, we've got time till 2 p.m. Just want to confirm that. Okay, so uh, over there. Uh, hi, I'm Christina from National Center for Health Research. I'm just interested in, um, I guess, EMR security, uh, less so, uh, I guess, the type of thing where infusion pumps or defibrillators are being hacked into, but more things, uh, and people are then scared to get that, but more things like STD testing and mental health uh, and abortion, for example. Now, these are things that people really want compartmentalized, and it would be much easier to get that kind of information. Um, I think that that's a much more likely, I guess, scenario, um, or at least a more likely fear that people would have. And I'm just wondering what sort of information, what kind of compartmentalization in the EMRs themselves um, is being regulated and should be regulated. So um, I can speak for, in general, how the EMRs work. So an EMR, if it's certified under the ONC rules and used by a meaningful user, has to meet the security requirements of HIPAA, which are administrative, um, technical, and physical, and there's sort of outcomes-based. And people, uh, again, those rules are issued by OCR. People ask all the time, well, what should I do to get that outcome? And of course, we don't write that down because then the bad people would figure that out right away and circumvent it. So it, it really is just outcomes-based. But in terms of what's required, so HIPAA does not require segmentation, we call that, of anything except psychiatric notes. And then um, state laws, there are many state laws in some of those areas, but not every state has every state law. So some states may adopt special rules for HIV AIDS and other states may not, for example. Um, some states may treat HIV AIDS as a particular kind of condition and, and STDs separately. Some may conflate those together. Um, those laws apply to the physician's behavior in disclosing the data, not to the EMR and whether it's sort of logically segregated within the EMR. So that's how it works. Um, there, because there's no federal standard that requires segregation except for psychiatric notes, um, there's no technical standard for that that's required. There are technologies, HL7 is working on some, I'll be talking about some at HIMSS in a couple of weeks, that enable that type of tagging and segregation, but it's not legally required under federal law. How would you navigate this in terms of, um, we identified certain things that, that you thought might be controversial, but then there's, you know, each of us could, <laughs> could come up with lots of different ways, and or there's status that might have once been controversial, like HIV, that is not as is, is evolved in terms of cultural This attitude. is like a whole other panel, you know this, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I actually have a little bit of just something food for thought for you. So we actually, you know, can look back. I'm a lawyer, I see things through that lens. We can look back at laws states have enacted where that's a very open and public process. People get to participate in it, you know, there are votes, all that kind of stuff. And in that respect, it is a type of consensus building in a way that a private policy is not. And that's why if you look at laws, you m might actually ha be able to sort of go, oh, it makes sense that this state would have a special HIV law, and this state, which tends to be much more um, religiously conservative, for example, might not have an HIV law because that's how that state's politics worked. Um, so there's that whole piece. And I, I, then I have my own personal views about the sensitive nature of health. I get it that their states have made decisions on behalf of their citizens. but. I've had this argument many times, is Viagra really sensitive when you can see an ad for it? Well, it's March Madness, so you'll see many ads every time you turn it on TV, but with any sporting event. And so we have the tools to collectively decide that certain conditions get special protect protection. We may not be using those tools very effectively, and some of those tools may, in fact, be out of date.
another. I don't know if others have a different sense about that. Alfredo's sort of going, I don't know if I agree with her. No, I mean, I, I, I think that um, my default is generally towards protection. And, and, and um, it's one thing to see a Viagrad and one thing to be, some, be, be a, you know, someone who actually has prescribed it. You know, mm -hmm. Those are very different positions to be in. So I, I would, in general, default to more protection and, um, and uh, uh, perhaps a more collaborative process. But, you know. but, but it, HIV is a really interesting example there. Because you think, think about New York has a pretty significant gay population. And they actually don't have an HIV protection law. In fact, it's kind of the other way around. And the, the um, public health research so, shows that that population is actually healthier than in other states. And they may have, uh, inc I think they've included protections where if HIV status is known, you can't take discriminatory action. So they've solved for the discriminatory effect that's in the uh, parade of horribles. But they um, sort of have created a system where they've destigmatized the conversation about it. I call it, uh, pardon the sort of pun, but the Harvey Milk approach. If we can destigmatize it and address the discrimination, can we learn from the data? I don't know. Just to add, uh, just to respond to that, I guess, I guess in my mind, you know, in the same way that um, it's one thing for the law to destigmatize it, and it's another thing for people to destigmatize it. Absolutely. In, in the same way that every time you speed, not every time you speed do you get caught. And so uh, just because the law says you can't discriminate on someone because they're HIV positive doesn't mean that people will stop that. Rather, it means that people will probably do it a little bit less, and then, you know, one out of the five people that does it will actually get, get called on it somehow, and then one out of ten of those will be sued, and then one out of a hundred of those will go to court, and, and, and maybe, you know, uh, 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 one out of 200 of those will, will, uh, will win. Let's get another question in. Uh, that's right back there. Yeah. Uh, Philip Dijon and Arnon Porter, uh, LLP. We talked a lot about the role of the regulators in cybersecurity. I think there's some consensus up there that maybe sort of uh, cybersecurity is always going to be an issue and devices will never be sort of hack proof. We've seen a lot of documents, whether it's the cybersecurity guidance document from FDA, the FIDESIA Health IT report, uh, the uh, interoperability roadmap. In terms of regulating to address this risk, it seems like you're not going to be able to regulate it away. Is there any recommendations in terms of where regulators should be focusing their time? And maybe if you are a regulator, maybe you have to pass on this question. I'm trying to think of if it's about sort of setting minimum standards, I think regulators are always going to be a couple steps behind either either the bad guys or maybe the private sector and either setting voluntary standards. Just wondering sort of how the regulators fit in here uh, in sort of a, a best case scenario. Um, so I, I am sort of a, I'm not, I don't write rules, but I'm in a quasi-regulatory capacity and I'll say two things. One is there's stuff being just debated about this right now on the Hill, like literally yesterday a new bill was introduced. So there's definitely dialogue going on about this and I think that from, um, you know, the president's executive order in January is, is really clear that one thing that we can do uh, from the government's perspective is facilitate people sharing identified threats so that other people know what threats to look for. I think you were saying, Kevin, that you know, if, if you can see this pattern, then you know what to look for. And we need to sort of replicate that behavior. So information sharing is definitely a key thing that the government can help facilitate. S small things, um, most of which I've already mentioned, I think FDA should limit uh, its discretion narrowly. Uh, 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 in a small way so that if I'm a health or fit, uh, uh, health app really or, or health wearable device and I'm collecting really sensitive information and I tell other people about your stuff without telling you that I don't benefit from that, that, that discretionary category where I, I don't need to submit approvals. So I think that is a um, regulator should focus on the undisclosed sharing of, of user information to third parties. Um, and I think the FTC should hold um, uh, uh, folks like Apple who make very good promises uh, up to those promises. So if Apple says, hey, you're, you know, uh, says to their consumers, when you use HealthKit, the apps that, that, use your, that pull your data won't be sharing it with others. Um, Apple should, be, should live up to that promise, and FTC is a unique position to, to monitor that. Um, I, I do think the debates on the Hill um, play an excellent role in kind of just in oversight and, and in sort of uh, um, setting best standards. Um, Suggested the best standards, but um, those bills just, you know, they're not going to pass. Um, they, they, well, they may pass, but I doubt that a bill that, you know, stripped away a bunch of authority from FDA would, would, would pass across the president's desk, you know. And so I think you're going to see a, a legislative stasis here, um, and you're going to have regulators be able to move um, and states be able to move. 
So uh, a couple, couple comments there. Um, one is on uh, uh, sort of a reality check. So if you ask the question, what, what can government do with regulation to improve cybersecurity of medical devices, it's different from what can FDA do. So mm -hmm. for instance, with FDA, there's very specific congressional language about uh, they have the remit for the safety and effectiveness of the devices for the manufacturing, not for the use, but for the manufacture. So if you're going to talk about mm. how a hospital is going to use what a manufacturer provides, sort of FDA doesn't have the official remit. If you want to ask about security, it's not, uh, except for a 1982 law passed about the physical security of over-the-counter drugs because of the Tylenol cyanide uh, incident in Chicago, there's very little mention of security in the actual regulatory language. Um, now, on the other hand, on the positive side, um, uh, at least in my experience, uh, I've, I've noticed that FDA has been very effective as a convener. Uh, so in fact, they recently held a cybersecurity workshop, I think it was in uh, October, and uh, I believe uh, over 1,000 people signed up, uh, mostly manufacturers. Um, so they, uh, what you'll find is, again, a lot of the, the low-hanging fruit. The, 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 uh, the knowledge of cybersecurity uh, is, is a mystery to many medical device manufacturers, and incentivizing them to think harder about it uh, is, is something that the FDA can do even without uh, regulatory action. Um, they, they, uh, uh, you know, they may take a regulatory action if, if there's some egregious case with cybersecurity. I'm, I'm certain they would if, some, if there's a death or an injury. Um, but in the meantime, they're focusing on uh, convening the parties, uh, uh, assuming the good nature, they, they, they do have a, a strong assumption of sort of the good nature of the companies to do the right thing. And if the companies don't do the right thing, they, they don't have a lot of choices. Um, but, but I can say uh, the companies who do show up to cybersecurity events generally tend to be mm -hmm. the ones who are thinking about it. And my worries are the ones who don't even know about the existence of the events. Uh, you might be wondering about them. There was a great tweet uh, showed up in my Twitter feed from South By, which said, you know, uh, developers are blissfully unaware of FDA and HIPAA regulation. And I think that's exactly right, that we have to worry about, you know, the next great, brilliant innovation, which could come from somebody's garage that isn't thinking about this stuff. And there's a back door in there that does eventually cause harm that people don't recognize. Or it's not an FDA-regulated device, nor is it offered through a covered entity under HIPAA. And it's in the kind of growing gray zone. So I want to close by asking each of you to peer into the future. So we can uh, peer into the future in terms of projecting if there's a prototype right now, it, it will hit market in a couple years. We can do that on the technical side, but I want you to help us wrestle with this space of uh, security, privacy policy. So what does it look like five years out or to put a finer point on it, how will it look different five years out compared to today? One way that it will look different five years out compared to today. And, and you want a prediction, not a dream, right? Mm -hmm. So didn't ask for you know um, unicorns and the <laughs> like. What 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 will it look like? What's your projection? I think that people will be struggling to improve the healthcare of Americans with a siloed healthcare system that we can't. We can't recalibrate the baseline rules on. I think that you will have a good chunk of people, let's say, I will say 10 years, that are using always on devices to prevent health conditions. I think that's wonderful. But I think you're also, unless security and privacy dramatically improves, going to have a growing po uh, size of the population that when they see a doctor about depression or an STD or something else, demands that the doctor use pen and paper and not put anything in the computer. Mm. Um, I'll be more uh, a bit of a Cassandra. Let's see. I'll, I'll say I think there's going to be less attention on security problems in individual devices and more attention on security problems in how those devices are interacting uh, in, in the greater system. Great. Well, please join me in thanking this great panel.